The all-wheel drive system used on Talon and Summit Wagon is designed to automatically distribute torque to the vehicle's front and rear axles. Under slippery conditions and during acceleration, all-wheel drive offers traction that is superior to that obtained with a conventional two-wheel drive system. To distribute torque, MMC all-wheel drive uses a center differential along with a viscous coupling in the transaxle. A transfer assembly relays torque to the rear axle, which may be equipped with another viscous coupling to limit slip between the rear wheels. Welcome to this month's Video Tech. In this program, we'll examine the all-wheel drive system as it occurs on Talon and the new Summit Wagon. The viscous coupling type all-wheel drive system first appeared on the 1990 Eagle Talon. The Talon TSI all-wheel drive model uses a five-speed manual transaxle or a four-speed automatic. A limited slip rear differential is standard except on vehicles with anti-lock brakes. On the Eagle Summit Wagon, all-wheel drive is used with both the 1.8 and 2.4 liter engines and is available with both the five-speed manual transaxle and the four-speed automatic. The limited slip rear differential is available as an option. In general, the all-wheel drive system operates in basically the same way on Talon and Summit Wagon. A transfer gear on automatics or intermediate gear on manual transaxles relays power to the center differential. The center differential then relays power to the front and rear axles. To prevent all of the engine's torque from being sent to an axle whose wheels are slipping, a viscous coupling is installed between axles. The viscous coupling consists of inner and outer plates, which are surrounded by silicone oil. Because of the force required to shear the oil in the coupling, the plates tend to turn at the same speed. As a result, as one set of plates in the viscous coupling increases in speed due to slippage at the front or rear wheels, the other set of plates begins to receive torque from the resistance of the silicone. This torque is transmitted to the wheels on the other axle. In case of extreme speed differences between the plates, the silicone fluid heats up and the plates turn together as a unit. This is known as the hump mode. On a Talon all-wheel drive model equipped with a manual transaxle, the inner plates of the viscous coupling are splined to the coupling hub, which in turn is splined to the center differential case. This arrangement provides a connection to the front axle. The outer plates are splined to the viscous coupling housing, which is splined to the center shaft. This provides a connection to the rear axle. The way in which the viscous coupling is connected into the all-wheel drive system depends on the type of transaxle the vehicle has. The arrangement we looked at for the Talon manual transaxle is the same as that used for the Summit Wagon equipped with the manual transaxle. On Talon and Summit Wagon all-wheel drive automatics, the viscous coupling arrangement is somewhat different. The inner plates of the viscous coupling link the coupling to the center differential. The outer plates link the coupling to the front output shaft. On all vehicles, power for the front wheels proceeds from the center differential and viscous coupling to the front differential. Power for the rear wheels proceeds from the center differential and viscous coupling to the transfer assembly. The transfer assembly uses a set of bevel gears to change the direction of power 90 degrees and to relay power to the propeller shaft. All vehicles use a three-piece, four-joint propeller shaft. To compensate for changes in angle and length in the prop shaft pieces, the propeller shaft has a component called a lobro joint. The lobro joint uses caged balls to connect the grooves in the inner and outer races of the joint. The grooves are at an angle to one another, allowing for changes in angle or length on either side of the joint. The rear axles on Talon equipped with ABS and on Summit Wagon not having the limited slip option use conventional differentials to allow for speed differences between the right and left rear wheels. Talon models not equipped with ABS and Summit Wagons with the option feature a limited slip rear differential, which makes use of a viscous coupling. The viscous coupling is identical in operation to the one in the transaxle described earlier. In this case, however, the viscous coupling inner plates are connected to the right-hand rear drive shaft, and the outer plates are connected to the left-hand rear drive shaft. 
When one of the rear wheels starts to slip, the tendency of the viscous coupling to minimize speed differences between the plates causes the transfer of torque from one rear drive shaft to the other. Here, the viscous coupling is transferring torque from the left rear to the right rear drive shaft. As in the transaxle viscous coupling, when the speed differences heat up the silicone fluid, the rear axle coupling plates are forced to turn together in the hump mode. When this occurs at low speed in a tight turn, an all-wheel drive vehicle may exhibit characteristics similar to those of a four-wheel drive vehicle. This is normal. The viscous coupling is a sealed unit. As a result, you do not need to check the level of silicone oil or add to it. However, you do need to check the level of the lubricants used in the transaxles, transfer assemblies, and rear axles we've looked at. That and lubricant types are the subject of the next part of this program. One important thing to remember in checking fluid levels on MMC all-wheel drive systems is that the vehicle must be level. Another is that the transaxles and transfer assemblies have separate sumps that must be checked separately. On Talon and Summit Wagon manual transaxles, the filler plugs are located on the transaxle case facing the front of the vehicle. The fluid level should be within one half inch of the bottom of the filler hole. The drain plug is located at the bottom of the transaxle on the same side as the filler plug. The filler plug on the Talon and Summit Wagon transfer assembly is located on the front face of the assembly. The fluid should be within one half inch of the bottom of the filler hole. The drain plug for the transfer assembly is located at the rear of the assembly on the bottom. To replenish or refill the Talon or Summit Wagon manual transaxles and all of the transfer assemblies, use 75W90 Mopar Hypoid Gear Lubricant. If you do use a substitute, make sure it has an API rating of GL4 or higher and a viscosity rating of 75W85. To check the fluid in the Talon and Summit Wagon automatic transaxles, first warm up the transaxles to normal operating temperature. Cycle the selector lever through the gears. And check the fluid with the engine at idle and the transaxle in neutral. The fluid level should be in the hot range on the dipstick. To replenish or refill the fluid in the automatic transaxle, use Mopar ATF Plus. The location of the filler and drain plugs is the same on all all-wheel drive system rear axles. The filler hole plug is located on the differential cover. The fluid should be within one half inch of the bottom edge of the filler hole. The drain plug for the rear axle is located at the bottom of the differential carrier. When replenishing or refilling the rear axle with lubricant, use 75W90 Mopar Hypoid Gear Lubricant. Make sure any substitute has an API rating of GL5 and a 75W85 viscosity rating if it is to be used in all temperatures. The reference manual accompanying this program contains a chart with the refill capacities for transaxles, transfer assemblies, and rear axles. Next, we're going to look at some towing procedures that will help your dealership avoid damaging the all-wheel drive system. We'll also discuss trailer towing and all-wheel drive systems. As we've seen, the transaxle viscous coupling is designed to equalize torque between the front and rear axles. So you can imagine what would happen if you tried towing an all-wheel drive vehicle with one axle on the ground and the other on dollies or on the wheel type lift of a wrecker. With this type of an arrangement, not only may the wheels on dollies or wheel lift attempt to move, but the viscous coupling may be severely damaged in trying to move the stationary wheels. You also should not use a sling lift to suspend one of the axles. Doing so will damage the bumper and cause lubricant to leak out of the transfer assembly. By the way, you shouldn't use a sling type wrecker on front wheel drive vehicles either. Doing so may damage the axle or the bumpers. On front wheel drive vehicles, use a wheel lift type wrecker and pick up the car by the front wheels whenever possible. The best way to move a vehicle equipped with all-wheel drive is to use a flatbed wrecker or place dollies under both axles. Of course, this is also an acceptable way to move a front-wheel drive vehicle. 
When moved in this way, vehicles with manual transaxles should be in first gear with the parking brake applied. Vehicles with automatic transaxles should be in park with the parking brake applied. All wheel drive vehicles can be towed with all four wheels on the ground. When doing so, place the shifter or gear selector in neutral and the ignition key in accessory to prevent locking the steering wheel. With the increased availability of all-wheel drive, you may find customers making the assumption that an all-wheel drive vehicle ought to be able to tow more than a front-wheel drive vehicle. In fact, while the all-wheel drive system is designed to enhance traction and performance, it is not designed to be used for towing. As a result, Chrysler does not recommend trailer towing with these all-wheel drive vehicles. An essential part of all-wheel drive service is knowing whether the viscous couplings in the transaxles and limited slip differential are doing their job. To check the viscous coupling in the transaxle, first warm the transaxle to normal operating temperature. Then raise the vehicle so that all four wheels are free to turn. Start the engine and place the manual transaxle in first gear and the automatic in low. Release the clutch or brake and allow the engine to idle. At this point, all four wheels should turn. If only the fronts turn, in addition to the viscous coupling, you'll need to check the propeller shaft and transfer assembly for damage. Next, raise the engine speed to 1500 RPM and gradually apply the parking brake. The engine RPM should drop as the parking brake is applied and the viscous coupling attempts to equalize torque between the front and rear axles. If the transaxle viscous coupling doesn't do its job, be sure to check the vehicle for unequal tire or wheel sizes. When tire and wheel sizes are not the same, the viscous coupling may have been damaged from continuously trying to equalize torque. On all-wheel drive vehicles equipped with a limited slip differential, you can also check the operation of the viscous coupling in the rear axle. To do this, first warm the axle to normal operating temperature. Then, after placing the gear selector or gear shift in neutral, raise the vehicle so that the rear wheels can turn freely. Verify that the vehicle is equipped with a limited slip differential by checking the tag on the rear of the differential. Next, place mating marks on the propeller shaft and rear differential flanges. And disconnect the prop shaft from the differential. At this point, turn one of the rear tires. If the viscous coupling is functioning properly, the other tire should rotate in the same direction. If the tests we've covered indicate that the transaxle or rear axle viscous coupling isn't doing its job, you'll need to replace it. Automatic transaxle viscous coupling replacement is our next topic. On Talon and Summit Wagon, replacement of the transaxle viscous coupling requires removing the transaxle from the vehicle. The procedure for viscous coupling replacement on a manual transaxle was covered in the April 1990 video tech Eagle Talon All-Wheel Drive Operation and Service. This program also covered rear axle viscous coupling replacement and Lobro joint service. In this program, we're going to cover viscous coupling replacement on an automatic transaxle. When removing the transaxle from the vehicle, use the procedure in the Laser Talon or Vista Summit Wagon service manual. And be sure to follow the steps for removing the drive shafts from the transaxle. Improper removal of the drive shafts could result in damage and unnecessary replacement. With the transaxle on the bench, remove the bolts from the output bearing retainer and remove the retainer and race. Use a rod 31 hundredths inches in diameter and about 8 inches long to punch out the rear output shaft. Then thread the special tool used for removing oil pumps into the center differential and remove the differential. At this point, to gain access to the center bearing retainer, Remove the idler shaft and gear. Next, thread two bolts into the center bearing retainer and remove the center bearing retainer and outer race. Remove the center bearing retainer stopper bolt from the valve body mounting area. 
and then remove the stopper ring. To remove the viscous coupling, place the jaws of a bearing puller on the viscous coupling grooves and remove the coupling. To install the replacement viscous coupling, use a bearing puller to support the viscous coupling and insert it in the case. Then install the stopper ring. If the race was removed, install the outer race in the center bearing retainer using the special tool. Next, install the center bearing retainer stopper bolt and tighten to three to four foot pounds. Then install the center bearing retainer so that the groove on the retainer is around the stopper bolt. And install the idler gear and shaft. Install the oil pump removal tool in the center differential and install the center differential in the transaxle case. The installation of a new viscous coupling may have changed the preload on the output bearing. So at this point in the reassembly, you'll need to check the preload and if necessary, select a new spacer. To do this, place two pieces of solder about half an inch long in the output bearing retainer as shown here. And install the outer race in the retainer. Install the output bearing retainer and race and tighten the bolts to 15 to 19 foot-pounds. Next, remove the bolts and output bearing retainer and remove the race from the retainer and the solder from the race. If the solder was not compressed, you'll need to start over using a piece larger in diameter. If the solder is compressed, measure its thickness with a micrometer. At this point, adding the thickness of the solder to the recommended preload will give you the thickness of the spacer needed. For example, suppose that the solder thickness is 35 thousandths of an inch. Adding the preload of from 3 thousandths of an inch to 5 thousandths of an inch gives us a spacer thickness of from 38 to 40 thousandths of an inch. Looking at the table in the service manual, we see that we can use either of two spacers within this range. To complete the reassembly, place the outer race and spacer in the retainer. And install a new O-ring on the outer bearing retainer. Coat the O-ring with automatic transmission fluid. Install the bearing retainer and bolts and tighten them to 15 to 19 foot-pounds of torque. And don't forget to reinstall the rear output shaft. The transfer assembly on these all-wheel drive vehicles can be removed from the vehicle and serviced as a separate unit. For inspection or service, the transfer assembly can be split into three parts. The extension housing, the transfer case adapter, and the transfer case. Disassembling and inspecting components in the transfer case adapter is straightforward, but if you replace components in this assembly, you'll need to be familiar with the procedure for adjusting the driven gear preload. To check preload, assemble the components using the original spacer under the roller bearing and tighten the lock nut to 102 to 115 foot-pounds. Then measure the rotating torque of the driven gear using the special tool to engage the driven gear shaft. Rotating torque should be in the range of 9 to 15 inch-pounds. If the torque is greater than 15 inch-pounds, reduce the thickness of the spacer. If the torque is less than 9 inch-pounds, increase the thickness of the spacer. If you replace components in the transfer case, you will also need to select spacers to adjust drive gear preload. To do this, assemble the components using the original spacers under the cover and behind the outer race. Then measure the rotating torque using the special tool to engage the drive gear shaft. Rotating torque should be in the range of 15 to 22 inch pounds. If torque is greater than 22 inch-pounds, reduce spacer thickness. If torque is less than 15 inch-pounds, 
increase spacer thickness. In adjusting the combined thickness, try to keep the spacers as close to the same thickness as possible. If you do replace transfer case or adapter components, another service procedure you need to be familiar with is checking the tooth contact pattern of the bevel gears in the transfer assembly. To do this, first apply a thin coating of a gear pattern compound to both sides of the driven bevel gear teeth. Then install the original spacer on the transfer case and install the adapter on the transfer case. Tighten the bolts to 26 to 30 foot-pounds of torque. Next, using the special tool to engage the drive gear shaft, rotate the gear set exactly one turn in the drive direction and one turn in the reverse direction. Unbolt the transfer case and check the gear pattern. Tooth contact should be centered on the gear teeth faces. If the tooth contact is too deep, the driven gear is too close to the drive gear. And you'll need to use a thicker spacer between the transfer case and the adapter. If tooth contact is too shallow, the driven gear is too far from the drive gear. And you'll need to use a thinner spacer between the transfer case and the adapter. If you cannot obtain a good tooth contact pattern by adjusting the position of the driven gear using the spacer between the assemblies, readjust the position of the drive gear by changing the thickness of the drive gear mount spacer and the drive gear preload spacer. For example, suppose that tooth contact is still too deep even after using the thickest spacer between the subassemblies. In that case, you would use the next thinner spacer in the drive gear mount location and the next thicker spacer in the drive gear preload location. Change spacer thickness until the tooth contact pattern is correct. Similarly, suppose that tooth contact is still too shallow even after using the thinnest spacer between the subassemblies. In that case, you would use the next thicker spacer in the drive gear mount location and the next thinner spacer in the drive gear preload location. Change spacer thickness until the tooth contact is correct. If you cannot obtain a tooth contact pattern that is close to being centered in this way, you will need to replace the drive and driven gears as a set and adjust the tooth contact pattern. Once you've obtained a good contact pattern, check to make sure gear backlash is in the three to five thousandths of an inch range. As you can see, all-wheel drive system operation and service procedures are fairly straightforward. And with the popularity of all-wheel drive vehicles, you're likely to see more of this system in the future. For further training in all-wheel drive, consider enrolling in the Chrysler Service Training Course All-Wheel Drive Talon at a training center in your area. That's all for this month's program. See you next month on Videotech. The safety recall detailed in this program involves 1988 and 1989 model year Renault Medallion passenger cars. On these vehicles, the fuse block wiring terminals may not provide adequate clamp load for positive electrical connection of the heater AC blower motor fuse blades. This may cause an increase in electrical resistance that could overheat and possibly ignite the fuse block and terminal wiring. To correct this condition, a new fuse holder must be installed, bypassing the original fuse block. Some vehicles may have already been corrected under warranty using Technical Service Bulletin 085590. These vehicles do not require further service for this condition and have been deleted from the recall. 
For repair of affected vehicles, a quantity of fuse holder parts packages, recall part number C3940436 will be distributed and billed to all involved dealers. This quantity will cover a portion of the total vehicles involved. Additional parts may be ordered as needed to support customer demand. To begin the service procedure, turn the ignition key to the off position and disconnect the battery. Next, locate the fuse panel located in the lower instrument panel to the left of the steering column and open or remove the fuse panel cover. Then, remove the fuse block from its mount to gain access to the wiring on the back side of the fuse block. After freeing the fuse block, locate the three wires routed to the back of the 30 amp heater AC blower motor fuse. These are the one red wire and the two smaller red wires routed to cavity number 15 on 1988 models or cavity number 16 on 1989 models. After locating the correct three wires, cut them as close to the fuse holder as possible. Next, strip about one inch of insulation from the ends of the cut wires in the vehicle, and also strip one inch of the insulation from the ends of the wires on the supplied fuse holder from the parts package. Slide a piece of supplied heat shrink tubing over each of the three wires and connect the vehicle wires to the wires on the supplied fuse holder by twisting the wire ends together. Connect the 10 gauge red fuse holder wire to the red battery positive wire on the vehicle and connect the two 14 gauge fuse holder wires to the other two smaller red wires on the vehicle. After properly connecting the three wires, carefully solder the twisted ends with rosin core solder as shown here. Next, center the heat shrink tubing over each soldered splice and shrink the tubing with a heat gun to seal the splices. On 1988 models, route the new fuse holder to the outboard side of the fuse block and tie wrap the fuse holder wiring to the wiring bundle behind the fuse block as shown here. Ensure that the new fuse holder is even with the outboard front edge of the fuse block. After properly installing the new fuse holder, resecure the fuse block to its mount and apply the supplied fuse location change label to the inside cover on the outboard side of the fuse block on 1988 models. On 1989 models, the fuse holder must be routed under the fuse block as shown here. Then the fuse block can be secured in its mount, trapping the fuse holder below the block. In this case, a tie strap is not required. On 1989 models, apply the supplied fuse location change label to the inside fuse panel cover as shown here. After applying the fuse location change label, secure the fuse panel cover and reconnect the battery. Finally, check the heater AC blower motor for proper operation to complete this service procedure. Dealers are urged to give their full support to this important program by serving all involved owners promptly and courteously. For further information regarding vehicle lists, repair parts, service procedures, and claim reporting procedures, refer to the Dealer Safety Recall Notification Letter, number 507. As we promised last time, a look at the new, more comprehensive warranty programs and service contracts Chrysler plans to offer your customers. For more than a decade, Chrysler has prided itself on providing customers with the best warranty in the business. That industry leadership in warranty has been one of the major reasons 
buyers consider Chrysler products. The new 1992 Owner's Choice Protection Plan allows buyers to choose the warranty that best meets their individual needs. In the next few minutes, we'll review the new warranties and how your dealership will process the customer's warranty selection. 1992 domestic car and truck buyers can choose between the complete protection of a three-year, 36,000-mile bumper-to-bumper warranty that includes everything except adjustments, normal wear, and maintenance items, or the long-term security of a 112 basic and 770 powertrain warranty. Laser and Talon buyers also have the same choice, although other details of their warranties differ from the domestic warranty. The Crystal Key warranty is basically unchanged, 550 basic and 770 powertrain. And as with all warranties, the deductible has been eliminated. Import buyers also have a choice in 1992. They can have the 336 bumper to bumper and 560 powertrain as before, or they can choose a 112 basic and a 770 powertrain warranty. The only time a deductible applies is when a customer buys a truck equipped with the Cummins diesel engine and has chosen the 336 basic powertrain coverage. In this case, the engine will continue to be covered by the diesel engine 7100 warranty. If a warrantable repair is required after the expiration of the 336, but within the 7100 diesel engine coverage, there is a $100 deductible per repair visit. If, however, they choose the 112 and 770 coverage, there are no deductibles on the 7100 diesel engine coverage. Warranties are still transferable to a second owner, and the second owner receives the remaining balance of the first owner's warranty. There is a $150 transfer fee, except for imports, which have no fee. Warranties are not transferable to a third owner. However, a third owner will automatically receive any balance of the 112 basic and three unlimited anti-corrosion warranties. This applies to all vehicles except imports, where all owners after the first automatically receive 336 and 560 protection. Emissions and airbag warranties remain unchanged for 1992. Emissions components are covered for five years or 50,000 miles. Airbag components are protected for three years or 36,000 miles. Buyers of 1992 vehicles must choose either the 336 or 112 and 770 warranty when they purchase the vehicle and sign a warranty election form indicating their choice. Your dealership must submit the owner's warranty choice over dial at the same time the NVDR is processed. To do that, you need to upgrade your dial software. Your dealership should have received a diskette with dial software version 3.90. If you have problems installing 3.90, call 1-800-638-6812 for assistance. After 3.90 is installed, Dial will automatically download another version, 3.91, to your dial system. That version contains error messages and descriptions to help you correct your NVDR input of the warranty selection. Now let's examine how warranty coverage is processed on dial. Once the owner has selected the coverage, you access the NVDR entry screen on dial by selecting menu entry number two. Then choose the new NVDR entry and select the entry that applies to the vehicle. If the buyer selected the 112 basic and 770 powertrain option, you'll use WARR7 in the program payment declaration field number one. Or for the 336 bumper to bumper warranty, you'll use WARR3. Vehicles not eligible for the owner's choice protection plan, such as guaranteed depreciation program vehicles, will use WARNA. Then enter the remaining information and process the NVDR as usual. Customers have 30 days to change their mind and choose the other warranty options. To do that, they'll have to contact your dealership and fill out and sign a change of warranty election request form. If the buyer wants to change the warranty coverage within 30 days, you'll use dial function 81. You'll find instructions for using function 81 in your dealership administration package. If you have not received this package, call this number, 1-800-521-0953.
When customers bring their 1992 vehicle in for service, you'll find the warranty coverage they selected on the back cover of their warranty coverage information booklet. The owner's signature will be found in the appropriate coverage area. Now, as always, you can verify a customer's current warranty coverage by consulting Dial. It's important to note that all warranty service procedures remain the same in 1992. The only difference is that you have additional warranty coverage codes to deal with. And by the way, revised pages for your warranty policy and procedure manual will arrive in late September. The 1992 Owner's Choice Protection Plan is not just competitive. It keeps Chrysler and your dealership in the forefront of customer protection. Be sure to review and understand all the 1992 warranty materials included in the Dealer Administration Kit. They will help you provide your customers with the service they deserve.